All right, my friends. How are you doing today? It's a beautiful day in the Meta Net. A beautiful day for the Meta. You guys know it. I'm the avatar of Beto Gudino right here in cyberspace. And today, it's, it's going to be amazing because we have a special guest I'm going to introduce to you in a few minutes, in a couple seconds. But first, I want to tell you about this idea that I've been thinking about lately. Will God be in the metaverse? It all started with Pokemon Go. So I'm the avatar of Beto Gudino. The real Beto Gudino, as you know it, is doing real stuff. He's taking his kids to school. And as I was thinking of school, that reminded me how I grew up in the 1980s. And we used to have a computer in our home. And the computer had this, this game of chess. And I remember I hated playing chess against the computer because I always lost. As a little kid, it was impossible to get through like <coughs> 10 movements on the, on the game of chess versus the computer. The computer beat me every single time. And then I'm like, I'm never going to play chess again. What's the point of playing chess? Well, my friends, things have changed. Things have evolved. Things, got, things have gotten even more more and more advanced nowadays. Have you ever lost a game to a computer? <coughs> See, we read that in China, AI has overtook investment as of 2017. Will we ever be enhanced humans? You know, my friend says, hey, we put chips in our dogs. Why don't we just put chips in our kids? Then we'll know where they are at all times. We can track them. There's no, there's no way they can get kidnapped. Or if they do, at least we'll know where they are. What a great idea, right? What are the things we're giving up in the name of convenience? Right? Well, we have an expert today that's going to help us navigate through these questions and more in this episode. His name is Jeremy Peckham, and he's the author of this book I have in my hands. If you're watching, it's called Masters or Slaves, AI and the Future of Humanity. Every time I read a book that says the future, I already love it, and I'm going to I'm gonna read it and I'm gonna look look for it. And I mean, it has right here a hand, like a robotic hand. So I'm like, okay, let's check this out. And today we have Jeremy on the show. Jeremy, are you there? How are you doing today? I'm here. It's good to, good to meet you. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me onto your show. Awesome, Jeremy. I'm so excited to talk with you. Your book is amazing. It has so many real stories of how technology is affecting humanity for the good, for the bad, for the what may it cause in the future. So it's an amazing read. I highly recommend it to people that love you know, to read about technology, morals, ethics. Well, today on the show, Jeremy Iwes, the main idea of today's episode is will God be in the metaverse? So first of all, Jeremy, would you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience and say, You know, why you are an expert on this topic of artificial intelligence and who you are. And actually, I would love to know um, where you're tuning in from, because I think, I think you're in England, right? I am indeed, yes. Um, your, your sun is just coming up and mine has gone down already here in the, in the UK. Um, Yeah, a little bit about myself. I have spent most of my life in artificial intelligence in a, a particular field called speech and natural language processing. You can think of Siri, Alexa, that sort of technology. That's the area that I started in uh, in the, uh, the last century, <laughs> the wow. 1980s through to, uh, to the 90s. And... Um, Yeah, it, it was a fascinating area to work in. Of course, in those days, it wasn't really fashionable to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, it was what we call the winter of uh, artificial intelligence because, you know, most people were trying to do it with rules 
uh, encoding how people did things, and it didn't really work very well. Uh, and we made a breakthrough in what are called statistical methods, which are the uh, essential foundations of how AI works today. Uh, and that worked uh, really well for uh, speech recognition. Uh, and that's the basis on which that technology works today. So I spent much of my life in artificial intelligence and became a, an entrepreneur, started my first company in uh, the late 90s and, and uh, did a stock market flotation when it was pretty unheard of for a pre-profit high-tech company to float on the uh, the main London Stock Exchange. So those, those were very heady days in the 1990s. And I guess really um, since then I have um, been involved in starting up other businesses, always kept an interest in artificial intelligence. And particularly over the last four or five years or so, really thinking a lot about the ethical implications of what is happening now in um, not so much in new discoveries or new capabilities, but just um, essentially the industrialization of artificial intelligence. Computers, uh, memory ha have got so much faster than when uh, I was working on it that it's now possible to put uh, speech recognition in a phone um, to do a, an awful lot of processing in, 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 a, in, in a, a smartphone, for example, things that we couldn't contemplate doing uh, in the, the late 1990s. So that's been my focus more recently, to be thinking uh, biblically as a Christian about um, what are the ethical implications of creating computers that seem to be, but aren't really, but seem to be uh, ever so much uh, closer to, to humans than perhaps we, we might have imagined. Mm -hmm. Wow, that, that is so, so interesting, Jeremy. And I love how you mentioned the 80s and how this all started in the 80s and the winter of AI. And when I think of, I mean, I grew up in the 80s and I grew up with movies like Terminator, Robocop, like all these futuristic movies about how technology was going to have a major role in, in the way society li lives, right? And, but, but back in the days, this is, what, this is why I wanted to talk about this today. Uh, back in the days, this seemed like a, a far-fetched future. You know, when I watched Robocop in the 80s, <clears throat> I was like, wow, that's interesting. Right. But it just it just looked like a science fiction movie. And that's what it is. Right. Exactly. I just recently yeah, rewatched yeah. the latest Robocop movie with my kids. And this time around, I'm thinking, man, we're no I mean, it still is science fiction. Right. But it seems like we're not so far away from from some of these moral and ethical uh, decisions being made in how we relate to robotics yeah. and even weaponizing robotics and things like that, right? So, mm, Jeremy, mm. I mean, th yeah, you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think one of the things that we have to uh, really get clear is, is that th there is a, a perception that artificial intelligence is what the name says, intelligence, but just artificial. Um, actually, it's not intelligent at all. And the, the sort of things that we do see in science fiction, some of the dystopian futures, if you like, do tend to project the idea that um, artificial intelligence is uh, intelligent, acting, reasoning, thinking, more like uh, a, a human being. But my view as, as um, a scientist and having worked in this field is that it is highly unlikely that we shall ever approach um, human capabilities. But what we can do now is to really quite impressively um, work on very narrow domains. So take speech recognition for, uh, for an example. We, we can recognize me speaking fluently the way I'm speaking now, people in different languages, different accents. And so people might be given the perception when they're uh, talking to Alexa, asking Alexa uh, to find something, th that they're actually talking to uh, a computer intelligence. Actually, all uh, Alexa has done, or Siri, is just learnt 
a whole bunch of data and it is doing statistical pattern matching, trying to take the sounds that I'm making now, for example, translate that into a text search and to search uh, enormous, massive databases to try and retrieve what might be uh, an appropriate answer. But actually, when we come to reasoning, well, why did you think that? Why did you come up with that result? Um, what lies behind that? Uh, the computer has absolutely no idea, would not be able to engage in that level of reasoning. But what happens is that people are looking on and they think, hey, this is cool. This is, this is really exciting. This is now becoming uh, like a, a human. And when we uh, add robotics uh, to, to that, um, whether it be two-dimensional, real-life looking avatars, um, or whether it be three-dimensional um, robots, uh, mechanical robots are getting more and more realistic. I think people are drawn even more into the perception that this is now becoming quite scarily like, like a human being. But actually, it isn't. It's, it's, it's just the perception that, uh, that this entity, this artifact, as I call them, is looking and behaving like a human. But it, it is an illusion. It is not a reality. But I think the thing that concerns me, which is why I wrote the book, is not so much dystopian futures, thinking about how this technology might develop in the, in the future, but actually what it's capable of today, how it's fooling us uh, and drawing us in to the point where I think we are becoming enslaved to this technology rather than masters of it. We're giving up um, things like moral autonomy. We're quite happy to think about self-drive vehicles or fully autonomous weaponized uh, uh, drones, for example. Um, we're, we're, we're happy to engage on Facebook, even though perhaps many people realize that AI machine learning algorithms are sucking them in, luring them in, keeping them on the platform. So it, it's like a slavery. Wow. Yeah, and when you talk about perception, um, that that's so interesting because, uh, for example, when I think of the metaverse and what it's in, and right now, you know, one of the questions I want to ask you is, what is a mirror world? So before we go into into that, when I think of the metaverse, um, the the first thing that comes to my mind is a social construct of social constructs, right? So it almost seems like it's a perception, but at the same time, it, it's a perception where you can perceive anything you want. Like you can be there and be an avatar of, you know, create your own avatar of something else. Mm. So in a sense, I feel like that's going to be so deceiving in, in the sense like, who are you going to really yeah. be when you enter this space, right? So, I mean, before we dig more into that yeah, and, yeah. and the moral ethics, like what is, what is a mirror world? What is the metaverse? Uh, Jeremy, can you enlighten us a little bit well, on that? It, 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 yeah, the mirror world is a term I use in one of the chapters of my book, and it was coined by uh, a Yale professor, David Gertner, uh, in his book of the same title, actually, in 1991. And, and the idea I think that he's getting across is really quite uh, prescient and thinking forwards to where we are today, and I guess to a degree what uh, Zuckerberg's vision is for the metaverse. But his idea was that we would be able to create uh, uh, places with uh, or, or, or a, a perception, if you like, of a space um, in our computers that, that looked and felt like a real place with, with real texture. And, and perhaps the one way of thinking about that today is the whole idea of um, a virtual or an augmented reality where we can be transported into um, another part of the country or another part of the world even, uh, and we can wander around streets uh, and, and sense maybe the, uh, uh, the, the, not so much the texture, because I think that is the, the tactile side that it will always be missing, um, but it's the sense of feeling that you're in, genuinely in another place and exploring that other place, whereas you're not. You're perhaps just sitting uh, at home um, 
in your kitchen or, or, or wherever, uh, but with some glasses on exploring a totally different world, uh, a, a world that is mirroring the, the, the real world, if you like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so that's the mirror world. That's that's kind of like the, the vision of the metaverse. And in this in this augmented reality, in this virtual reality, I think maybe, uh, uh, I mean, this is kind of like what, how, am I, how I am interpreting and I'm trying to understand what it's going to be, what it's going to look like. But it also <clears> seems <throat> like it's going to be like the next level of the internet. You know, so if we think of the internet almost like as a yeah. two-dimensional way of com connecting humans around the world, it's almost like, what if we can create that internet in a way that feels more 3D, yeah. right? It feels more almost like tangible yeah, yeah. where yeah. we can be, I mean, we could be like right here, we're talking through a screen, right? But what if we could be yeah. seeing our own avatars in 3D yeah. talking to each other without a screen and yeah. in a space that seems like the same space? Right, it, it, that's kind of yeah. like the that that is that is absolutely uh, the, the the vision I th I think uh, uh, and that's Mark Zuckerberg's vision obviously is is the next generation of of internet which will be uh, in a, a, a three dimension but I think you said something earlier that really put uh, the finger on it for me and it it is a deception mm. and uh, one of the things that I argue in in my book is that we we really do as uh, God's creation need to stay connected to the real physical world because that is the world that God made. That is the world that he uh, placed us in. He made us with, with a physicality. You know, we have bodies, we have souls, but they're not disconnected. My, my mind, my soul, the, the real me expresses itself Uh, through my body, through I'm moving my hands, you know, getting uh, passionate about the, the topic, um, making expressions with my face. That is how God made us and intends us to express our, our soul, our inner being. And I think the danger of this whole idea of a, of a metaverse is it uh, disconnecting us with uh, the embodiment that is part of who we are how we are created. It is taking us outside of ourselves and placing us in a virtual world. Um, and, uh, of course, you, you could ask the question, well, wh why is a company like uh, Facebook involved in this? Why, why have they uh, partnered and, and even you know, bought uh, companies to develop this sort of technology? Why, why would a social media company want to be there? Well, if you think about it, um, what uh, they've done very, very successfully with over three billion users now is to suck people in, to engage uh, as long as possible on the platform because uh, more engagement means uh, more advertising, more profits. And, and so the whole idea of the metaverse, um, in my view, uh, quite cynically, is to create something that is even more immersive uh, and sucks us in and keeps us engaged on the platform for longer. Uh, and you, you can bet your bottom dollar that there'll be uh, adverts personalized popping up here and there, but now in a virtual space. Uh, and I think that it's just taking us away from what is real, um, what is tangible, what is tactile, uh, and, and deceiving us even more so than the uh, internet does in the uh, in the two-dimensional world. So I think there are huge dangers. There are huge dangers here, particularly for uh, younger generations who get sucked in at an early age uh, and just find themselves completely addicted to the point where, you know, they, they, they no longer live in a real world. And I think if you see the way in which um, gaming has gone in this direction, Uh, some people who are professional gamers, if you like, you know, that somebody was telling me the other day, you know, that when they're in a competition, they're wearing diapers and uh, they, wow. they, 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 they don't want to stop. They want to be continually immersed in this, this gameplay and, and not take time out to, uh, to, to go to the, the toilet. Uh, it, it, it's a ridiculous world and it's not the, the world that God created for us to inhabit.
Wow. Yeah, that <laughs> that's totally insane to think of <clears throat> of not wanting to even have time for your real physical self once your mind it's it's <clears throat> so off in this other universe. And but but I love the fact that you bring gaming to the no to today's conversation because I witnessed the same. I witnessed that kids love video games, right? I mean Uh, my kids play a few mm, video games mm, on the mm, you know, Xbox or PS and whatever. But the idea of the metaverse, I feel like I, I tell my kids, guys, it's almost like if Wreck-It <coughs> Ralph, it's blending in together with Ready Player One. And that's kind of like what the metaverse mm. is going to be like. It's going to be like internet on steroids and communicating with people through avatars and stuff. But yeah. but but yeah, yeah. the part of the deception and being sucked in, into this world... Um, that's why it brings me to this 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 main question of today. Like, will God be in the metaverse? And I want to compare this to uh, you talk about in your book about um, the Gutenberg Press in Germany. Uh, so you talk about Johannes Trithemus, who was against mm -hmm. this idea of printing books uh, <laughs> over written manuscripts, right? And I feel like, in a sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, books became a thing, right? B books were printed and the Bible was printed. So yeah, even yeah. as now I yes. think of the of scripture, like becoming, I mean, not becoming, but being available on <coughs> an app and people can download it. So my, I, I think, might, be, might sound silly, um, but I think will something like this, something like the Christian podcast ever be able to be completely... Uh, no, uh, an avatar in the metaverse where it actually can broadcast hope to avatars, you know, to people who are lost in that world, mm -hmm. to people who are completely gone, you know, who are pooping in their pants because they don't want to leave this place. Will will that yeah, be a yeah. possibility yeah. that God can show up in in that realm? I mean, is that too far fetched? I don't know if I'm just getting like too too futuristic. I, I, I think you this. raise. Yeah, I think you raise a very interesting question. And uh, if I can go back to the uh, the Gutenberg Press, uh, uh, just to, to build off of that, um, I, I think one of the things we need to realize is that uh, technology has always shaped us as individuals and also particularly as a society. And I think the printing press is a, a very good example of that. Uh, and, of course, people uh, critiqued it in its day because... Uh, You know, they saw a threat, maybe as 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 the monks saw a threat um, to to their ability to finally write everything by by hand. Um, but we have seen enormous advantage of the the printing press, not the least, of course, putting uh, the Bible in the hands of the ordinary person. Whereas previously, it would have required uh, somebody skilled, uh, somebody maybe who could uh, speak and and understand uh, Latin to. Uh, read the, the, the scriptures and then to be able to translate them to, to the common person. So we can see it, it's really shaped our society. And during the Reformation, of course, it, it had enormous uh, impact as, as uh, Luther's tracts became available uh, and actually also had some unintended consequences. So the fact is that technology uh, shapes us. Uh, in my view, it isn't neutral. It's not neutral because we all of us uh, come to the, the development of technology with, with values. Um, those who uh, produce and sell the technology have, have values, and very often that's where the, the problem comes in because it's profits rather than morals. Uh, but then we as users are uh, shaped. We approach technology with our own value system and we use it maybe in good ways and we, we may use it in bad ways. And I think here is, is the rub of all technology and particularly when we, we start to think about uh, the metaverse and whether God will communicate uh, with, with people through the metaverse. And I think we need to ask ourselves the question, um, is, this, is this something that is... Um, building uh, on, on, on God's purposes for us? Is this enabling us, for example, to be uh, the, the Christian community that God wants us to be? Or in some way, are we dumbing it all down? 
And uh, in, in my book, I talk very much about the image of God and how as uh, Christians, uh, we believe that we are made to imitate Christ. Uh, Christ is the exact representation of God. And, and Paul tells us in uh, Ephesians to imitate God, in Colossians to imitate Christ. Uh, we read in, in Hebrews that Christ is the exact representation of God. So what we can see in all of that is, is that as, as a Christian, as a believer, we are being um, encouraged to put on Christ, to behave in the way that Christ would have us behave. Now, that brings me back to the point I made earlier, that uh, God has created us as physical beings. Uh, we are unique. Uh, we have animals that, that have a physicality as well, but they don't have a soul in the way that uh, we think about our soul. And so this, this combination of the real me, our consciousness, um, and uh, our bodies are unique to, to humans, to humanity. And that is something from a Christian worldview perspective we should be seeking to preserve. So when we come to thinking about how do we reach people uh, for Christ to tell other people about our Lord Jesus. The question I would want to, to put is, well, um, how do we mirror um, God's purposes and, and what Jesus is like if we then seek to do that in a disembodied uh, virtual reality? If you think about it, um, our Lord Jesus, you know, he is God. He could have been everywhere uh, in in the world when he came to earth but 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 he didn't do that he didn't choose to do that he chose to be constrained uh, mm -hmm. by the same way, uh, physicality if you like in which you and i uh, are constrained he walked with people he talked with them one-on-one -on -one in small groups why did he have 12 disciples rather than you know a thousand who could broadcast uh, his the, the gospel the good news throughout the world um, he's demonstrating to us, I think, our Lord Jesus, that um, what is important is community, relationships, one-on-one. -on -one. And one-to-many, yes, he spoke to, to, to the 5,000. He, he, he oftentimes spoke to, to large groups. But, but he also um, spoke one-on-one -on -one and developed one-on-one -on -one relationships and so I think that we should be very, very wary of the idea that we can, uh, we should be cautious about how we use the internet, even the two-dimensional internet. But to think about, um, uh, in some sense, as you're meaning it, uh, God speaking through the metaverse, I think I would say to you that God speaks through us as his uh, image bearers and that he would not have us inhabit that metaverse as a way of uh, sending, setting him forth and proclaiming the gospel. I, I don't know whether that's that's making sense to you, but I'm trying to, uh, to to get into that question that you're raising. A very interesting question about uh, will God inhabit this this metaverse? Yes, and yeah, I, I agree with you in everything you said. The only thing that um, if I would pushback is is the very fact that mm -hmm. um even even as i'm reading the book i'm like wow i i almost applaud and i'm, I'm like that's amazing that a christian is behind this technology and it's actually asking all these moral and ethical questions i mean that's amazing but to me it feels like the world doesn't think i feel like the majority of the world doesn't think christian you know they don't think in the terms of like oh will will god be here will god be there is this what god would like i feel like they're just moving on right like like mark zuckerberg right yeah, like yeah, he's yeah. just pursuing yeah. his vision of yeah, yeah. of what he wants for humanity yeah. and um well first be before we dig a little more into that i i feel like a <clears throat> concept that would be helpful for the audience to to understand is what you talk about in the book about transhumanism and you say that high-tech mm -hmm. companies subscribe to so it's almost like this idea that humanity uh will be transformed into different beings like post-humans uh and you know when i mm -hmm. when i read tweets from elon musk uh, uh you know and he says no we're about to connect neurons to technology and things like that i'm like whoa 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 i mean yeah. 
Okay, these guys don't have don't they don't have this this yeah. uh Christian background, right? They're they're not asking the question, yeah, yeah. oh, is this yeah, God yeah. what God wants? Yeah. So I feel like they're just moving forward with it. But would you enlighten us on, on what is yeah, yeah. transhumanism? How is is do you see a yes, bifurcation yes, that, of ideologies in yeah. with technology? Yeah, I, I do, and and uh, I'd love to come back on, on your point about uh, where the, the world generally is going. Is it moving on? Uh, so, so let's hold that one and come back to it. But to deal with the the question of, of of transhumanism, one of the things that I think it's helpful for us, if, if there, any of you are listening and and you have a Christian worldview. Um, it's helpful for us to remember that those who do not hold to a Christian worldview, who are naturalists, materialists, for, for them, for example, uh, the material world is all that there is. It's actually quite natural for people of, of that way of thinking uh, to conclude that, you know, the computer is, is uh, sorry, the brain is just a computer. Uh, and before long, we'll be able to replicate uh, the human mind and, and even go beyond it. And that is really the agenda of uh, the, the, the transhumanists. It, it comes out of uh, humanists and, and a humanist agenda. Uh, and it's the idea that we can augment uh, our humanity, our, our capabilities, uh, particularly our minds, uh, enhance ourselves by um, not just plugging ourselves into AI, but having AI uh, assist us and, and, and maybe be cleverer than us. Uh, and, and uh, of course, uh, the computers are going to be able to store vastly more data than our human mind is going to be able to store and recall. Um, but then the, the whole idea is that eventually um, we will reach a, a post-human phase where um, computers really far surpass what uh, uh, humans can do and we're limited, uh, they would see, by our physical bodies, which are decaying. And of course, one of the agendas is to see how we can use computers to uh, help us to live longer. But, uh, of course, ultimately, if I can upload my brain into a computer, then I can live forever. Mm. Uh, and it's interesting, isn't it? it this yes. is a notion that we as Christians know that we have eternal life uh, if mm. we trust in Christ and put our, our, our faith in him. Uh, and those that don't somehow are still looking for this eternal life, but, but they're looking to uh, computers to try and uh, solve that for them. So I think it, it's important to understand why people are thinking like that. And there are a number of uh, key players, major players in Silicon Valley uh, and beyond, uh, uh, heads of uh, CEOs of, of, of companies who do have that way of thinking. Now, I, I think it's it's a, a relatively narrow group of people, and it's not necessarily a view that's subscribed to by the general public, who probably don't even know what transhuman, transhumanism is, um, for, for starters. But uh, just to say that there are those who seriously think that is the way technology is going. And, of course, if they're heads of companies, uh, big big tech uh, companies, then th there's an agenda there that they will want to push in terms of where their companies go and the, the billions that they invest into uh, development. Interesting, isn't it, that uh, I read that Mark Zuckerberg's looking to recruit 10,000 people in Europe uh, to work on the metaverse. Uh, I mean, 10,000 people. Wow. Uh, most companies couldn't even contemplate uh, devoting that uh, resource to research one uh, narrow area. So I, I hope that's addressed a little bit your question about the, um, the, the what transhumanism is and what that, that agenda is. And um, I would just say that it, it, it's it's... It's not a view that I think a lot of people subscribe to, but significant people um, in terms of control of companies do subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's kind of like the, uh, I don't know, the, the oh, what's the, the word? The heaviness or the, the concern is that how can so much power if you think, I mean, I, I think of this as power, right? So how can so much power mm. be in the hands of so few, right? And if, I mean, when I think yeah. of Google, I mean, 
I honestly, I feel like these guys are ruling the world. These guys are government. I mean, they have government capabilities yeah. in a yeah. sense, right? So whatever <clears throat> these guys think, yeah. it's almost like everybody accepts. I mean, whether you don't like it or like it, it's almost like this is the way it is. You know, we're becoming better mm. humans or advanced humans. Mm. And it's, it's either, I mean, can there be another way? Is there another way or how can we yeah. battle against like this big tech um yeah, yeah way of thinking yeah i i think uh there is pushback not just from uh christians uh, i i would say actually unfortunately i think the the biggest pushback that i'm seeing is not from the christian community but from concerned people um you you look at uh, major documentaries that have come out that have stirred an awful lot of interest the social dilemma coded bias just to name two um, as a result of those, uh, th there's been a significant amount of interest uh, amongst ordinary people, if I, I can put it in those ways, uh, to the power that, that big tech has over their lives. So I think we are seeing uh, pushback. Um, Tristan Harris, who is an ex-Google uh, ethicist who, who runs uh, uh, Humane Tech, um, and uh, you know his pushback is on the the use of uh, smartphone and how it's sucking us in um, and you know, trying to educate even developers to think about uh, how to develop humane technology. Mm. So there is pushback. And I, I think, of course, at governmental level, you'll know well in the, the US, there's been uh, significant debates about uh, Facebook and, and Google and whether they should be broken up, whether they should be held more accountable. And I think um, this is something that uh, is quite controversial, but I, I don't see too many politicians being willing to grapple with it. And that is the real problem lies in the data. If you have no data, you have no machine learning. Mm. And uh, you have no AI algorithms. And, uh, of course, the huge success of uh, the likes of Google and Facebook over you know, a relatively short span of 15 years uh, or so is that they've been able to build um, a free platform, free to, to us users, uh, off the back of harvesting absolutely every keystroke uh, and everything that, that, that we do on, on the internet. And that has brought them billions of dollars of, of uh, advertising revenue. Uh, one of the ways that you could kill the, 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 the problem that we have overnight is just um, make data private. Uh, mm -hmm. I am a great advocate for saying that our, our data now, uh, our digital signature, if you like, the, the things that come from us, whether it pixels of our face or that my speech now um, should be granted something akin to copyright. It should be uh, acknowledged uh, legally that uh, this is, is part of me. It's part of my personhood uh, and, and that companies should, should not have a right to, uh, to that data uh, any more than I have a right to to walk into to your studio and, and pick up your microphone and walk out with it and say, thanks, you know, that's mine. Um, and, uh, of course, they all say, well, you know, using our services, you are acknowledging uh, that to use the service, you're letting us have your data. But no one, no one who uses the Internet has any real clue uh, just uh, how their data is, is, is used. You'd have to go through its reckoned probably hundreds of contracts and sign each one individually to unpack the way in which uh, our data, what I'm calling our private data, is, is packaged up and sold on. So it's not informed consent. Uh, and one of the things I'd like to, to really press for and get uh, good conversations going over is the whole idea of, of, of privatizing our data, having that recognized in some way um, legally, um, using, uh, I'm going to delve, delve into a bit of tech here, but using what's called blockchain technology to uh, the same technology that's used in cryptocurrency, for example, used to encrypt data, to track where data has been. Uh, and this, I think, could be extremely powerful. If you think of the problems that we're now into with uh, deep fake 
where even kids at school are beginning to get bullied now by people who can just find the right place online, free software to, to morph an image onto, onto something else. Uh, and this stuff is becoming highly realistic. We've seen classic examples of politicians and celebrities who've been uh, the subject of uh, you know fake, deep fake. Uh, but but when it comes down to 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 you or me and and, and somebody trying to extort uh, money or damaging our reputation, um, we have to think about ways in which we can push back. And it all brings us back uh, to to data uh, and how we treat data and whether it is just a free data lake as uh, as people are wanting to build now uh, around the world where. You can just do whatever you like with with everyone's data. Wow! Yeah. So the the key yeah. is in how we utilize this massive amounts of stored data. And I mean, in, in the book, you give amazing examples of even what's happening in in China with CCTV cameras all over the place. Even you mentioned there's there's one camera for every two person. I mean, that's that's unbelievable, right? And these cameras are not just a camera. I mean, that means we can trace faces. We can know who people are. You know, you can enforce <clears throat> the law, you know, through the yep. through face recognition and, <laughs> I mean, biometrics and yep. things like that. Immense, immense the yeah. impact of technology. Even in the book, you say technology changes culture. So, um I guess the, the, well, data, how do we utilize our data is going to be key in the success of, of staying humans, right? Um, what are some of the, yeah, 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 yeah you were going to say something. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. Data is key and having control of our data is, is, is key. Uh, to, 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 to having some mastery over this technology so that uh, particularly big tech uh, is not allowed to just constantly know more about us than perhaps we know ourselves uh, and to exploit that uh, for, for profit. I, I mean, there, you know, there are many good things that we can do with technology, good things that we can do with, with artificial intelligence, but it isn't just about the availability of data. It is about thinking um, carefully about where we want to go with with technology. I, I think it's John Havers that made the point that you know we we too often are doing things because because we can without asking the question should we uh, be I I inventing these these applications. So whilst it's good to um, let me take an example. I, I can see nothing wrong with scientists trying to make facial recognition software better and better, and more and more accurate. Uh, and, and we might think that having something that is really um, accurate and robust to, to open our phone without us having to uh, put a thumb on it and so on, that, 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 that's cool, that's, that's useful, it, it, it's helpful, it, it secures our phone. But that's one thing where I'm giving consent to whether I buy a phone in the first place and whether I think that, uh, that that facial recognition software could be perhaps misused by somebody who steals my phone. It's quite another thing now to say, well, okay, facial recognition software, let's let our law enforcement services use it. And of course, the argument is always, oh, well, we can catch terrorists and we can make you safer. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, would we rather be freer and less safe, or mm. so safe uh, that you know we we're just uh, afraid uh, because we're no longer uh, able to have free speech. We no longer have uh, freedom of 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 movement and the and the privacy that I believe comes out of being made uh, in in God's image. And these are key questions for us. Uh, and and you know the answer isn't obviously oh, uh, because we could catch a few terrorists, we must be allowed to use facial recognition software. It's a very, very slippery slope because China's a, a very good example of this. I mean, uh, you know, 
forever. H- however, people might criticize China, at least they're open about what they do. <laughs> uh, most Western governments are not open about what they do. They do things covertly. Wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, that that is the real question. And if we, we see how a, a nation like China uses the technology, uh, they have a different ideology, a different worldview to, to many Western countries. But what is to say that a Western government doesn't begin to erode our democracy and our freedoms as they uh, begin to take uh, this this technology into uh, mass surveillance? Um, what about the church? You know, at what point may it be may it become illegal to say certain things? Uh, some Western countries are. Are moving in that direction now in terms of uh, if you say something that you believe the Bible teaches uh, now becomes potentially hate speech um, or homophobia or Islamophobia or, so, or some other phobia. Um, imagine how this technology could be used to police what we what we say in, in private or, or even in a public uh, church meeting. Mm. So we, we do need to be very, very careful with the, uh, the 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 slippery slope uh, setting precedents for using this this technology in areas that seem uh, to be good but actually could be very very harmful to humanity in in the long term mm-hmm. yeah we give up i feel like we give up free speech and that comes to the the honest question that my friend made because uh, she loves her kids and she said i mean it was it was totally honest like we put chips in our dogs why can't we just put a chip in our kids right i mean she was completely honest about and i mean and she's a believer you know she's a christian but i, I guess she's yeah, not yeah. thinking about like yeah. all the yeah. ethical implications and what you're giving up what yeah. freedoms you're getting giving up what rights yeah. you might be giving up when you decide to do something like that right and even as you talk yeah, about yeah. crypto yeah. Uh, wow. So, for example, one of the things I think is going to happen in the future <clears throat> is will we ever have some sort of way of voting through a crypto system where we know we know everyone's vote is counted for and there's there's no there's no way to to have. OK, you know, this <laughs> no, like like it happened here in America uh, a couple months ago where you know we're not so sure all the votes were counted you know we're not so sure they everything was um done properly and crystal clear and this has happened in many countries i'm from mexico right and it's it's not mm-hmm. new that in yeah. mexico the same thing has happened so now with the world so global with the you know rise of crypto nfts like all these new technologies uh will we ever be in a in a, in a will we ever say hey let's just maybe put on a chip it'll have my voting information then you know my ideology who i like but then like you're saying it becomes a state of surveillance where hey we we kind of know the data that you're you're using these words when you preach or you're using these words when you speak we consider those to be in this category therefore you need to be right now the word is canceled right but what is going to be later i know put in jail Uh, yeah, yeah. you know, you got to be shut down, <laughs> uh, not participate, even as, as I read scriptures and read like, you no know, apocalypse uh, or revelation, uh, not be able to participate in buying or selling, right? When we talk about the mark of the beast, I don't want to mm. scare people. All I'm saying mm. is what if this has to do with like all this new realm of the crypto, of a chip, of AI, of algorithms, of speech recognition, facial recognition, in a way to say, if you don't submit to this order, you're out. You can't buy. You can't participate in society. You think, I mean, is that dystopian or is that just the Bible? I th- I think it's it, it's not completely dystopian. I think that um, there's already discussion about uh, cryptocurrencies and, and national banks wanting to go in that direction. And, of course, uh, you can see the advantages. You can uh, 
perhaps begin to to, to solve uh, money laundering issues. Mm. Uh, there's a, a clean audit trail of of, of where funds have gone. Um, but you know that that sort of technology could be applied in so many different ways, as you've already alluded. And the key question that we have to keep coming back to is how does that damage humanity? How does it damage um, what we are as those made in God's image? We, we, God didn't create computers. Uh, he didn't create artifacts. He created flesh and blood uh, uh, and breathe into us, and we, we have a soul. Uh, and, and it is, you know, me and you uh, and, and all of our listeners and, and watchers out there who God has created to be his representatives, his vice garants, the, the people who are to image him and show what he is like in the world. A computer uh, can never do that, will never do that, um, because uh, that's not, uh, how God made us. That's not what God's design and intent is. So I think that we have to be those who, who push back. We have to be those who understand our times, mm. uh, can see the way in which our, our world is going, the way in which technology is going, and, and not be uh, Luddites. That is, these people who say, oh, no, we, 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 you know, we, we, we can't have uh, technology. We must run from it. I mean, I, I'm a techie. I'm a scientist. So, uh, you know, I, I, I do embrace technology. But I, I know enough about it and, and its dangers to also say that we must use technology responsibly. We must think carefully um, about how we use it. And, and always, in my view, it should be to um, enhance who we are as, as human beings, to enhance our humanity, not in the sense that transhumanists uh, think of it, but in a way that it serves us, not becomes something that, that actually um, uh, takes us over. I come back again to the title of my book, Masters or Slaves. What I'm really pleading for here is for us to get a uh, discussion going to, to really understand this, this technological world in which we live and to really think carefully about whether we are masters or slaves. I mean, your friend putting a chip in, in, a, in a child, I mean, why would you do that? Um, what, how does that sit into um, the concept of, of us being given moral autonomy, given um, freedom, which is a part of the whole process of, of, of uh, uh, moral autonomy, and, and, and together are the very things that enable true love to, to be possible. Uh, why would we want to track and, and, and control through, through uh, electronic wizardry? Um, you know, the, the, one of the things that I, I think is part of this um, uh, post-human thinking, I guess, of, 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 of the future is, is to try and uh, create perfection. Mm. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, there is no such mm. thing this time of Christ's return. For those of us who, who are Christians will believe uh, that we will not be perfect until Christ comes again. Uh, and so we have to be very mindful that we are are, are fallen creatures. Uh, and I think, you know, even people who uh, are not uh, Christians, who are not even religious, I think we can, we can see, looking at the world around us, that this, our world after millennia is not getting actually any better. We're seeing the same uh, violence, the same greed, the, the same problems that humanity ha has experienced uh, from, from the get-go. And so, you know, that's the perspective that we, we must always have, that we are those who are work in progress. Uh, and there is no such thing as, you know, that perfect utopia that we can create with technology. So that means that we, we have to accept, you know, that our kids will sometimes not do the right thing. Our kids will sometimes run off. We have to role model to them. We have to love them. We have to be there with them. Um, and and get back to this notion that um, what really matters is real, genuine, human-to-human -human, uh, relationships um, rather than virtual re relationships. 
I mean, we're, we're using virtual technology now. I'm, I'm able to speak with you uh, in California and I, I'm in the UK. Uh, and that's great, you know, but I, I guess I'd much rather be sitting having this conversation with you with a steaming mug of coffee actually mm. in your studio. Yes, uh, coffee. And, you know, have it, break it, breaking a cookie, yeah. Um, and... You know, the same is true of, of speaking. I do quite a lot of speaking and, and, you know, I miss the real audience. Mm. And then speaking with people after, people coming up, they're shaking your hand, they're engaging with you, you have a coffee with them afterwards. Um, these are the aspects of, of being human that we must not let go of because we have got this, this, this digital world which uh, seems so cool to us and so convenient and, and so efficient. Mm -hmm. My friends, heed the words of a scientist, of a believer in Christ, who is making a call to us to wisdom and to ask the question, are we becoming masters or slaves of this technology? And Jeremy, I mean, this conversation has been amazing. I want to end on a, on a fun note that I called the emoji reactions, all right? So now your, your job, as we get uh, towards the end of the episode, is going to be, you got to give me, so I'll tell you, these emojis are, it goes from blasphemous, wait, where are my hands? <laughs> okay, here, blasphemous, <laughs> skeptical, inspired, holy, And I don't know where my finger is. <laughs> kind of hard to tell here on the computer. But anyways, this one's divine. So blasphemous, skeptical, <laughs> inspire, <laughs> holy, and divine. So Jeremy, uh, you got to come up with a phrase for each one of these to wrap up the episode. All right? So if I say oh, goodness. the first emoji, what is <clears throat> as it relates to technology, to AI, what would be the most blasphemous idea out there that you can think of i think uh that we could create a post-human future with computers uh, surpassing surpassing humans all right so that would be that's, that's not a, yeah that would be blasphemous yeah, that would be my red one <laughs> the red one okay <laughs> let's move on to a skeptical what are you skeptical of when it comes to technology and the use of ai I'm, I'm certainly skeptical that we will ever create uh, general intelligence, let alone super intelligence. All right. What inspires you as it relates to technology or AI? I think it's the way in which we, we can do useful things. Even the uh, podcast that we're doing today is, is helpful. I think as long as we keep things in check and don't allow this technology to take over, as we were saying earlier. Uh, I, I think it, it can be uh, inspirational and can be helpful, but, but we just have to keep it in check. Awesome. What about, what about of technology and AI? Is there anything holy in this realm? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a very difficult one. I can't think of anything that I would describe as holy, and, and that is because, you know, technology is an artifact, and uh, we have created the artifact, and we are fallen uh, creatures. Um, the only thing that is aspiring to holiness is, is humanity, or us as individuals, not technology. So that's a no-no, I think, for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. And I mean, in the book I you talk about... With, don't even go with the last one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't, uh, I mean, go read the book because you talk about Imago Day, and I think that's super holy right there. So check that out, my friends. And that is, yeah. the last that, one that is, is yeah. divine. So maybe outside of the artificial intelligence and the technology world, what ideas do you consider divine? I think the most obvious thing I come straight to is, is the, the Bible, um, because that is God's word to us. And that is what should be guiding us, not technology and what we can do with technology. But if we 
if we see God's word as uh, him speaking to us, divine inspiration, then that can guide us as we think about all of the other uh, areas that we've talked about. So yeah, I, I, I just have to vote for the Bible. <laughs> so good. All right, my friends. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of Christian Podcast or watching. Some of you are watching here online. I just want to say, Jeremy, this was phenomenal. Where can people go to find out more about who you are, what you do, if they want to find out you know, uh, know where they can get your book? I'm yeah. laughing because I'm still seeing these emojis in my screen, and I just think it's, it's just funny. <laughs> But uh, let me push them out. They are funny, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, uh, if, just go to jeremypeckham.com. That's my personal website. There's links to the book and uh, many talks are on AI. Uh, then I have uh, something that you might be interested in is a study guide that goes alongside my book. It's a video-based study guide that you can do in small groups or you can do it individually. Mastersorslaves.com masters or slaves no question mark just masters or slaves or one word dot com uh, and go check that out um, jeremypeckham.com or masters or slaves dot com those are the two resources uh, that you can uh, find out more about me and more about what I think about artificial intelligence awesome